Here I am. Last week was wonderful. We talked about, you know, brothers and sisters and abominations and divorce and not getting divorces. And I mean, whoa, you know, crazy stuff. But it's what Jesus was talking about. And it was because the Pharisees questioned him, right? So today we're in the next verse. Because he said all that about the two becoming one flesh and what man God has put together, how can men take apart? And all that good stuff that, you know, he made them male and female and we need each other. The next verses are this, verse 10 of chapter 19. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, is it better not to marry? Or it is better not to marry. He said to them, Not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way. What a great word, huh? <laughs> eunuchs. Just kind of makes me pause. So let's just move on. There are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. There are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by other men. And there are also, and can anyone say ouch? Uh, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs, oh my goodness, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Unbelievable. The disciples came forward after Jesus answered the question about divorce. Talking about getting together, don't let it come apart. And they're saying, well, if we can't break it apart, if we can't taste the different flavors, shouldn't we not get married? He said, not getting married, not seeking out the wholeness of God's creation, the two becoming one, only very few men can handle. Then he went into this eunuch thing which makes every man in the room squirm, if you know what it means. Let me just tell you the literal translation, castrate. Some men are castrated by others. Some men castrate themselves. Some men are born without equipment. You follow me? Like, oh my gosh, is anyone leaving? What are they talking about in the Christian church? Well, it's what Jesus said. And it's about male and female relations. Last week we talked about marriage and the holiness of marriage. And that you don't just go out under the stars and get married. You don't go, you go before God. And in a ceremony, the two become one. That's what we talked about last week. But today we're talking kind of about eunuchs and... This desire to be married and this desire to not be married, is it better that men not be married? And Jesus said, only a few can do that. And really, the rest of us should desire to become whole. Only those chosen to live unmarried should live unmarried. And to, and to not be married is a difficult concept. Now, I didn't know that, and I wanted to be married for... All the wrong reasons. And uh, when I got married, I was completely lost. I was bouncing off walls. I didn't understand this feeling. I didn't understand the difference. Why is things... I mean, it was... I was spun. Yep. And I was trying to figure it out. Because no one explained it to me. This, I understood the word, to become one. Okay, cool, that's awesome. My mind can see that. Good. But my heart couldn't understand it. And so, he made them male and female. And he made them eunuch. Now, in the past, in for many hundreds of years, people would make men eunuchs so that they could serve their wives and daughters. If you, wanted to, if you lived in a palace, if you were a monarch, and you had the princesses and the queen, or all of the royal women, you wouldn't have men serve them if... They weren't eunuched because you wanted to be able to trust. And men are not very trustworthy who are not eunuched. And so they would volunteer to be this, to be able to live in the palace. Life outside the palace was horrible. 
See, they dealt with human waste every day. You guys, just hit the lever. It's gone. They dealt with it every day. They thought a good solution was a gully in the road where it all ran. That's what their, that was their modern solution was open sewage. They dealt with things, but in the palace you didn't. It was a totally different life. And so people would volunteer for this. They didn't have trouble finding eunuchs. Because to serve the queen and serve the princesses, you got all the benefits of life, the ease of life, the pay of life. It was pretty good. So this subject was not uncommon amongst them. And they knew some people are born deformed, and other people decide out of um, devotion. Now there was a guy named Origen who was writing about Jesus. He was a commentator for Jesus. And he read this and he castrated himself. And then he read it again and said, oh, I was wrong. Missed it by this much. So in his writing, he changed his mind. But it's too late. So, the way God made us, male and female, and there is gifts and talents to be in male, and we live in a time right now that is anti-male. All over the world, there's this pressure to celebrate feminism and to push masculinity down. There's, it's crazy. When you look at billboards... You look at TV, you look at everything, you see this draw toward, towards this lust and towards this worshiping women for all the wrong reasons and all the right reasons, but improperly used. And in every TV show and every movie, I just went to a movie yesterday where three women are beating up all these men and they're beating up robot people. And they, they have all this power. And in every episodic TV there is, the women are now kicking butt on all these men. They get in these strongholds, and this man, this big old muscular guy is holding them, and they break free, and they you know, kick them and beat them. And, and, you know, it's just not true. That isn't happening. And sometimes it's these little girls beating up these big guys. There is a superior physical nature that you can't change in Hollywood. There is gifts and talents and abilities men hold. There is also the God-given leadership that God gave men, in terms of the man being the priest of the household. So, what we have done in history is we have wafted in and out of these time periods where everyone worships femininity. And most of the time in the past, they've gotten to the point of worshiping only the reproductiveness of women, and they make them queen of heaven or queen over all the earth. And, And Aphrodite's was all sexual. Hellenists, all sexual. Ra, the sun god, was neither male or female, but mostly what the attributes were all feminine. And they would, so they go through these, now we worship the women. When Paul was writing his letters talking about women, he was talking to the Corinthians and to Timothy in Ephesus, I think. And it was about those societies were worshiping women. They were worshiping feminism. They had not just female gods, they had the worship of female, uh, the worship of estrogen. Then it goes, and you know, we all know the the time periods where men then take lordship and push women down and, and, and put their foot on their head and try to destroy them. Now, my time as a Christian, my growing up, is a time where women were just now breaking free but still under thumbs really bad. Like giving them the vote. It's just like, how did you ever take away the vote? You know, kind of thing. It's like, how did you think women weren't valuable enough to vote? Well, you you got completely out of balance. Women can't speak. That's a real popular trend, even in today's church. Don't let the women speak. Men trying to control the gifts and talents of women. When the truth is, the way it should be, is that a man and a woman leave their home, and join together to become one. When she speaks, he's speaking. He's talking about the covering of a man. But he is supposed to be the priesthood. There is submit and serve. The, the commission to men in the household is that we 
lead our women's as Christ loved the church, laying our life down for right. them, surrendering and submitting to them our life. Women have a really much easier task in simply fashioning their life after the man who's an imperfect. Their, their model is imperfect. Man's role is perfect. You understand what I'm saying? So I have incredible talent. I have strength that she can't match. She has strength I can't match. So somewhere in the early part of my marriage, I realized what I'm freaking out about is I'm whole for the first time in my life. Her gifts and talents have been molded with mine to make me whole. I am suddenly operating with a grace and a kindness and a friendliness and a bright personality that I didn't have before. I am suddenly, the parts of me that were lacking are filled in. The two have become one. Can you imagine, I, just, just for a moment, imagine the father's house without Vicky. Can you imagine the father's house without me? Both are important. But in our life, what has happened is, I immediately said, she is great. Why would I push her down? And we began to live our life with me protecting her right to be seen, protecting her right to shine and show her gifts and talents. It really is our choice whether we do that or not. My daughter, Danielle, took over the business office. Where would the world, where would the father's house be if my daughter, Danielle, a woman, wasn't free to go lead the business office and build it? She's no longer in the business office. Someone else that she raised up is also a woman. Where would the church be without her leading the business office? My daughter Danielle's husband is not intimidated by her leadership, but knows when to take her aside and say, let's talk about this. This is what I believe. The lady that raised up in the business office, her husband is not intimidated by how smart his wife is. He's not intimidated by how talented she is. Danielle also built up the worship team because her husband isn't intimidated by her gifts. She was able to build this up. He did not try to pull her down. Quiet, woman. Quit outshining me. I am not intimidated when my wife gets up with the microphone. I am thrilled. She's my favorite person. I love to hear her talk. You follow me? So my daughter, Danielle, raised up others to lead worship, a man and a wife. You heard the wife today. Her husband is not intimidated by her getting up here. He works the soundboard to make sure she sounds great to you, to make sure she shines. He, he allows her to shine by not trying to lord over her. My gifts and talents, my strength, I am no longer that man. I can't outrun everybody. I can't outwork hardly anybody. I am no longer strong. I'm not. It's time has taken its toll. But I have gifts and talents. I still have the same fire. I still have the same drive. The, the pit bull comes out of the hedge. I still step towards it. Tell my wife, get behind me. Because she doesn't have that kind of power. She doesn't have that kind of courage, that warrior mentality. She needs me to step between her and danger. She needs me to be the one to go check the noise that we hear outside. She needs me to step up and be what a man is. And in this world, we have pushed, we are now at a time where toxic masculinity is a word they're actually talking about. Right. Toxic masculinity. Well, men, we deserve it. We've done two things. Where we've had power, we've shoved them down and said, be quiet, woman. And there where we've had weakness, we have abdicated our throne, our priesthood. We have walked away from our responsibility of fathering, Good. husbanding, Good. Uh, what's that word, breadwinning, I guess? Provision. I am God's hand in my family. Who provided for us? God. Who did He use? Me. My children are phenomenal. But they won the lottery of the womb. 
in who their mother would be. That woman mothered them. I did not interfere with mothering. I know how powerful mothering is. She did not interfere with fathering. She knows how powerful fathering is. There are eunuchs by choice, but only few should be eunuchs. The rest should be godly men, priests of their family, who stand up and say, I am, I am the priest of my family. And I know that I can listen to my wife, I can take her opinion 10 out of 10 times, and I did not abdicate my throne. Because I know when the rubber meets the road. I know when it's important. And I say, listen dear, this is what I'm hearing God. And I hear you, but I can't violate what I think God told me. She will every time, 100% of the time. We don't even use the word submit. We don't even use the word I'm the leader. It never comes up. But I guarantee you, if I said those words in that way, she'd say, I'm with you. The most powerful thing she's ever said to me in my life was after great business failure and the worldwide economic crash, we were facing some terrible things. And she was struggling with it, having a hard time with what the future might hold. But only for a moment. I stood strong, stood with her, stood over her, prayed for her, because I knew the truth at that point. And I knew she'd come to it. Stood up and said, you know what the truth is? I said, what? I'm with you. Wherever you go, I go. If this hardship in the world has us living under a tree out here, then I live under a tree with you. I was willing to live in the house on the hill when we could afford it. If the tree is what's next, I'm willing to live with you there. I was willing to take all the money that was flowing in and use it. I'm willing to live in the time of no money. I'm with you. There has never been a thing, more powerful thing said to me than I'm with you. You'll hear me during worship all the time say, Here I am, Lord. I'm with you. I learned that from my wife saying it to me. How powerful it is to hear the words, I'm with you. Where you go, I go. What you believe, I believe. I've never once had to force her to believe anything. She believes what I believe. I believe what she believes. I've been willing to listen to her. And she says things. I consider them. Because I know that God's going to hold me accountable to what I believe. Not her. She's going to hold me accountable to what we believe. But I let her influence and feed and contribute to what we believe. You follow me? This is, not, this is the opposite of toxic masculinity. This is extremely powerful masculinity. That's right. And this is what we're going to do in this conference coming up. It's a man-maker conference, I tell you. It's a man-making conference. I don't apologize for that. Amen. One day we had a P61 team come from another country. The man, one of the men just wept around the fire. That's right. I said, what are you crying for? I have no problem with men crying, by the way. If a man can't cry, there's something wrong with him. We need inner healing. But this guy's crying. What's going on? He said, in my country, it's already almost against the law to be a man. And I look around here at all your men becoming men. And it breaks my heart that we can't be men where I live. People, we lose manhood. We are in deep trouble. I'm not. We need. We need womanhood, and we right. need to. Nur, we need to nurture womanhood. Right. We need it to be powerful w- feminism. We need estrogen, and we need testosterone. Right. But we need men to do it right. right. To be the kind of men who take on the shield and the sword and stand between danger, who step up and go to work. That that saying of John Wayne's. Courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. That's what men need to be. That's who men need to be. We step out into it. We deny ourselves. We control ourselves. For every woman in this room but one, I am a eunuch. I am a eunuch by choice. I am a eunuch and you can count on it. Ladies, you can trust me. To be a father and a brother to you. I am not a stalker. You are not my prey. 
Do you follow me? That is not true with every man in the room, and that is not true with every man on earth. But you can count on me. You will not hear different about me. I will fight the fight, and when the thoughts come, I will shoo them away. You can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop one from making a nest in your hair, and I will stop the nest from being made. I will stop the thoughts from... And you can count on me. I am not your enemy. I am your priest. I am your pastor. He called me and I knew what he was calling me to be. I said, oh no. He said, oh yes. I said, okay. (laughs) And here I am. I have not always been successful. But I have been here as the pastor of the Father's house. I have submitted myself to the truth of the Lord's words. So what does that have to do with eunuchs? Men shouldn't desire to be unmarried. Paul said the opposite. He said men should. But then again, he said that because he believed the Lord would come by the end of that day. He said it's eminent. It's right here. Don't even get married. Don't worry about it. Forget about sex altogether. Just serve the Lord. Well, it's proven to be a little longer than he thought. And so if no one got married, there'd be no Christian babies. But he called us, he also understood that purity and righteousness were really strong man-making talents. Honoring yourself by being honorable so that other men might say how honorable you are. Honor's a gift a man gives himself, and we will teach that in this man-maker conference. We will teach that purity. We will teach how to stand up and be a priest, how to walk with the Lord how to nurture your wife into being the greatest she can be. What we should be doing is helping our women be greater, not lesser. We should help them be exposed in the proper sense for their gifts, their talents, their abilities, their love, their kindness, their ability to have friends. I mean, I envy, I have always envied my wife's friendships. I, I, I don't even know if my testosterone would allow me that. And I'm not apologizing. I love friends, but theirs are intimate. Come on, guys. You know, we don't even want to be that intimate. But I envy their ability. You know what I mean? So, for this reason, men shouldn't marry, right? No, the opposite is true. Men should marry if if they can. But if they can, they should look at marriage completely. Last week, I told you how to look at marriage. This week I'm telling you how to look at marriage. You marry a woman and it will complete you. And if a marriage is two becoming one flesh, why do you want to shove half yourself down? Why do you want to subdue and enslave half yourself? Why do you want to browbeat and criticize half yourself all the time? I ask men this all the time. So did you want to be married to a man? Is that why you're trying to make her act this way? And they're always like, what? Where'd that question come from? Well, the way you're trying to make her act is like the response of a man. Why don't you let her be woman and you be man? I say to the woman too, why don't you let him be man? Quit trying to make him respond like your girlfriends. It it shouldn't happen. And you shouldn't want it. Are you following me? (sighs) The scriptures I have to preach on these days, you know what I mean? So, I think that if you're not married, you never have sex. Or even come close or think about it. Seriously. If you've been through the ceremony, if God has performed the miracle, if you have become one with each other, I think you should do it a lot. I think it's a really important part of the two becoming one. If you're able, you should. Because it's intimacy. Part of who my wife is is the fact that I desire her makes her feel powerful. Part of who I am is because my wife knows that. And we come together and it empowers me. My daughter is who she is because her husband is not intimidated by who she is, but is free to be 
who she was created to be. And she is powerful. And he, his life is enhanced by that. I can just go down the list with all the other pastors in my church. The, their husbands are not intimidated by who they are. But every one of them, if their husband said, this is where God's leading us, would go. They would say to me, I hate leaving, but I'm, I'm, my husband feels we're called here. I'm going with him because I'm with him. And so there's this leadership that isn't really leadership. It's agreement. That's right. But when it comes to the end, when it's down to the nitty gritty, I'm telling you, this is what the Bible teaches. So this is what we practice and this is what we teach. A eunuch is someone that's castrated. And I think that there is such a thing as mental castration, and that's what I'm promising you. I will not think with the wrong thoughts. I promise. It's not easy for me. I don't want... I, I am like any man, but I make promises. And I'll try them with everything in my being to keep them. Every one of you men should be making these promises. If you have a girlfriend, you should be promising them, I will be strong. If you have a wife, you need to promise them, I will be strong. For every sister and mother in the room, I will be strong. You can trust me. You can count on me. You're safe with me. Most of the wounds in this church, most of the wounds in this room come from men not being strong and women not being strong. We need to make this commitment. I will be woman. I will be man. And I'll do it right. I am preaching what the Holy Spirit's telling me to say, and I am preaching from the Word, from the words of Jesus Christ. He's teaching this stuff that not too many of us should try to be eunuchs in terms of never and no wife. All of us should try to be eunuchs in terms of our mind. And Lord, we pray we need your strength. So many of us struggle with this. The fact that we even imagine pornea is sin, is adultery, is immorality. Lord, just those facts are before us. And I am amazed by you, Lord. You are my King and my God. I bow my knee to you that to live in your palace, I would not violate your covenants, your rules, your your ideas, your teachings, your love for me that I would not grieve the Holy Spirit. And I pray for my friends here, Lord, both my male and my female friends here, Lord, that we would come to a better understanding of your Lordship. That we would come to a better understanding of sonship to one another, of spiritual, non-biological sonship, brothership, brotherhood, And that we would begin to control ourselves, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We ask you, Holy Spirit, for more of that fruit. Because we need it, Lord. The world has gone amok. Being a man is not popular. Women need men. Men need women. We need to celebrate each other. We need to nurture each other. I'm a good man because I have a phenomenal woman. She's a great woman because she has a phenomenal man. I pray for my brothers and sisters here that they would be phenomenal men and women. Sisters and brothers. Sons and daughters. Mothers and fathers. Let let the Holy Spirit minister to us. If you have any confession in your heart, if you have any desire or feeling of failure in this area, I just welcome you to speak to him right now where you sit and just confess yourself that, and, and really just confess that you want to be, help me be better. Help me overcome. Help me overcome. The best men I've ever known in my life are in this room with me. The best woman I, women I've ever known are in this room with me. We are going in the right direction. Join us. Pray, Lord, heal my wrong thinking. Teach me your ways. Lead me in the way that is righteousness in dealing with my sisters, my mothers, my my family. Oh, Lord, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it is your righteousness that 
girds our loins. It is your spirit that brings us truth. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come upon us. Teach us. Lead us. Fill us. Walk with us. Let us know you, Lord. Let us know you, Lord. give your life to Jesus you want to become a Christian for real maybe you were one time and you walked away come and pray the ladies will be on my left your right the men will be on my right your left we invite you to come and pray with uh, gender specifically come to the person and they will pray with you these are ordained people in the Father's House Church our service is over stay as long as you like Come and pray if you need to. God bless you. Go out and win the world for Jesus. By our love, they know we are your disciples. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.